absolutely love that. I have just literally finished watching New Zealand against South Africa. I haven't even had time. I've got notes scribbled down. I'm just going to splurge out my initial thoughts following the game, which I'm sure you've watched as well. If you haven't and you're waiting for the score, this is your spoiler alert. So uh, you've been warned. I'm going to reveal the result now. Well done, New Zealand. A bit of a beatdown in the end. And, well, the game, when you look back at it, was decided in those opening 20 minutes. Lots to talk about. I'm Tim, this is Egg Chasers. If I haven't already, I'm really hoping I will earn your subscription on this video. Uh, loads of videos are going to be coming in the build-up to and during the Rugby World Cup, so hit subscribe and leave your comments. What is your reaction to that? I don't know what I'd be thinking if I was a, a South African right now. I probably, well, actually, probably I think the um, this face once again... Um, <laughs> that was your average South African, I think, during that opening quarter of the game. But uh, yeah, uh, firstly, actually, man in that photograph there. Just want to mention, before we even get into the game, um, Eben Etzebeth, amazing that he even played the game, having lost his father this week. And uh, the guy showed uh, a lot of guts just to turn out there on the field. Not the result he and his teammates will have wanted and food for thought for South Africa uh, for New Zealand, well, they have laid down a marker, haven't they? That was that's a statement. That is a statement victory, and they uh, they haven't been considered as the force that they deserve to be considered as up until this point. But now the rugby world is going to be taking them very very seriously, and that I mean it's just even more ramping up to that opening game on September the eighth between France and New Zealand. Um, absolutely epic. And of course, New Zealand and South Africa will play each other again at Twickenham, but this was the real one, I think. I think there'll be lots of changes uh, for the game at Twickenham, and that's two weeks out from a World Cup, so who knows, this was the one. It's going to be the decider for the Rugby Championship, you would feel. And um, it's it was two first teams going head-to-head. -head. And this may be... The, the showdown ahead of a potential World Cup quarterfinal or even potentially a World Cup final. So, uh, where do you begin on this one? Well, let's just start with the fact that this was the shot of Razzy Erasmus at halftime. And you can see Peter Steff de Toy. I mean, these are, these are guys that are in the background just looking like he doesn't know what's going on. These are guys that have won a World Cup. They were out of ideas come halftime. And that is just credit to the way that New Zealand played the game. I also think it demonstrates naivety in South Africa. And it's easy to Monday morning quarterback it and, and sort of say after the fact, oh, well, what about this? But there were people, myself included, looking at South Africa. Well, I think the first thing I said on the preview video when the teams were announced, go back and look at the video. The first thing I said is, who's going to kick for South Africa? They had Villemza, Vili LaRue, Colby, Faf de Klerk, but no out-and-out -out 10. And I think it's easy to say it after the fact, but when you come up against real good teams in Rugby World Cups and you know you face the top teams in the world like South Africa did today, I just don't think you can go into a game with without uh, someone in your team that can tactically manage things. Damien Villemza is a fantastic rugby player make no mistake, but there's a there was a giant Andre Pollard-shaped hole in that South African performance today and that team. There was nobody that, when things weren't going their way, was able to go, I've got this, I'm going to get us in the right parts of the field, I'm going to make the right decisions, I'm going to get some territory, I'm going to tactically um, manage this situation. And the flip side, after DMAC had such a good game for New Zealand last week, Richie Mwanga was under pressure and, boy, did he answer the questions. That, that was a statement performance from Richie Mwanga, who was outstanding. And again, he was he, he was part of a team that were excellent, but he just made good decisions. He's kicking off the tee. What was it five out of six in the end? Some of them from the touch from the touch line. And me, New Zealand will not have games that go that much their way uh, when it gets to knockout stages of World Cups. These games are going to be tight, which just emphasises even more why you need people who have got real variation in their game. And New Zealand today had variation. Bowden Barrett and Geordie Barrett and Richie Mwanga between them were able to territorially kick 
and just make good decisions. And there was just the variety in New Zealand's game. That's what really impressed me. The, the short passes down the blind side, the drawing and then to draw South Africa in and then letting it go wide. And when there was space, you had Will Jordan just um, tearing it up in wide channels. He had a, he had a fantastic game. And I know a lot of people have been thinking, well, it's a it's a Jordan or it's a Bowden Barrett. I, I really think the pair of them in the backfield works brilliantly. And I've said before on videos what I think about Bowden Barrett. I think he's uh, un, unfairly and unduly criticised. And I mean, he, he can drop a he can drop a little crossfield kick on a on a sixpence as he did. Um, so yeah, lots to love. And then, and then defensively for New Zealand, wasn't it? They, they just, they were big men like Jasper Visa. He's under pressure now. He, he's an international number eight and his whole thing, Jasper Visa, and this goes for a lot of South African players. His whole thing is physicality. And he just got stopped dead at the game line by guys like Shannon Brazel and Brody Retallick, who were monsters. Uh, in this game today so lots of food for thought and um just just i'm just gonna i, I, I scribble down a load of notes I've, as i say i'm just recording this video immediately after the game so i can get it out straight away and also just so i don't think too much and i just say what i what i feel and get your reaction i want your reaction doing the same but the scrum for new zealand i think there was a scrum penalty for south africa where they absolutely dominated new zealand but actually it was solid for the most part and new zealand were really clever kept the ball in field a lot of the time, which made these massive men like Franz Malherb, Lou Diaga, be on their feet and running around constantly. And it denied South Africa line-out ball. And we saw when they brought the bomb squad on and Malcolm Marks got involved, that actually they, they can use that as a weapon. But generally, they weren't able to because New Zealand didn't let them. It was just tactically very smart. And South Africa just compounded issues by making mistake after mistake after mistake. And poor decision after poor decision. And New Zealand got the better of the aerial battle, which we don't normally see. They were, they looked sharper. And um, it was a point a minute in the opening 10. With that try from Aaron Smith. Brilliant break by Will Jordan. Loads of short passes. Um, yeah. The foundations were really solid. Tactical masterclass, as I've said. Um just one thing. Oh, yeah, that's one thing I noticed. I did wonder at one moment whether the the, the DJ from Pretoria had been flown over, over with the South African team and given the reins because uh, I started hearing some 90s hip-hop in the stadium there. But uh, then they mixed it up and they played Muse and uh, that cheerleader song and some other random stuff. Tell you what, the selection of music in the Southern Hemisphere but is random. How bizarre. Is, is all I would have to say about that. Good tune, that, mind you, from New Zealand. Uh, right, let, let's get into some negatives. South Africa, there's quite a few. Again, it's easy to say after the fact, but I did say this earlier in the week. Uh, I, and I just want to point out that I got some... I, there was some quite negative comments when I said, I'm not convinced at the minute by Dale Ande and Lacanio Am. They were amazing in the last World Cup. They are both brilliant players, but they're not playing at their best right now. And I think possibly Esther Hazen and Creel might be the way to go in the centre for South Africa, particularly Andre Esther Hazen, who I thought was immense last weekend. I didn't think Damian Diolande had a good game at all. The one thing he does do is get you over the gain line, and he, he didn't really do that. Again, he just got stopped dead. And I, I just... When you think the, the 10, 12, 13 for South Africa, not convinced by at the moment... Libok was good last week. Vilemza is a brilliant player, but they just need someone to kick when it needs to be kicked, to send someone in and be physical when it needs it. And I, I'm just, in tight games like this, I think Andre Pollard is, is the way they have to go. And I, I, I think Andre Esterhazen is, is knocking on the door for a starting spot. Um, so yeah, I'll just put that one out there. Uh, just another thing, the, the commentator, I can't remember his name, Nisbet, is it? Did he think every single South African back was uh, Makazoli Mapimpi? At one point, I'm sure he said Mapimpi, passes to Mapimpi. Mate, come on. Um, do your job. Uh, and, I mean, my, my pronunciations are, are not great, but I do love it when you get New Zealanders pronouncing South African names wrongly and, uh, and, and vice versa. But like I say, 
I can't talk on that one. Oh, right, yeah, that's one point. So I, I, I mentioned Razi Erasmus not looking happy at halftime. There's one reason. I think a lot of South Africans probably aren't feeling very happy at halftime. If only... Oh, let me go the other way. If only there was clear evidence of a ball being grounded for that first disallowed Cheslin Colby try. Now, it would not have changed the result. But all you want out of officiating decisions is consistency, isn't it? I don't mind... If, if that's not a try, fine. But then... Don't give those tries, you know, when a winger's reaching for a ball and they just have their little finger in contact with the ball when it touches and they ground it and they give a try. Just be consistent. Uh, the referee said, what did he say? He said um, there was no... He did not press down on the ball. Well, that's not in the laws. As we know, the number of times those wingers go to score tries and they they just have, like, one fingertip in contact... And and it's and they say we well, don't actually need downward pressure. You just need to have contact with the ball when it when it grounds. As far as I'm concerned, that's a try for Cheslin Colby. Or at least, if it's not a try, then let's have consistency across the board. And those little fingertip ones aren't tries either. Just have it all one way or the other. Um, but I don't want to get bogged down in refereeing decisions because, like I say, South Africa had far more that they could have controlled that they got wrong that that they needed to. The bomb squad came on early in the in the second half and did make an impact. And again, that's that's one question mark you've got still got to put against New Zealand is do you remember it was always the way in that period, the the Richie McCaw, Dan Carter days, it was always the way that New Zealand could be losing a game, but then in the last ten minutes they would just blitz teams and and find a way to win. And that was partly mentality, but it was partly fitness and conditioning, I think. And they would just go through the gears as the game went on. There's a little concern with this New Zealand team that they start really with big intensity, but then they tail off at, at the ends of games. And again, had that had this Cheslin Colby try been given and the margin been smaller, you might have started to get a little bit twitchy. And they will need to put in an 80-minute performance in order to win a World Cup. So that will that is a little area of concern I've got, but. Part of that is the fact that South Africa had some huge human beings, Peter Steff de Toy, Malcolm Marks, world-class players coming off the bench and did make an impact. And when, when you add those solid foundations and massive men with a little bit of sprinkling of stardust, like that that Villy LaRue pass to Cheslin Colby and that awesome dive, um, South Africa have at least got something to take away from it, but it was a poor performance for them. And they've they've got they just must do much much better as for New Zealand in terms of selection I think I mean I, I, last week I was like oh does that mean d going to be the main man at 10 Richie Mwaka <laughs> and Bowden Barrett I think you have them both in your team and uh, that was an impressive statement performance like I say uh, Scott Barrett in the second row was, was excellent as well and Shannon Frizzell is now He's now thrown it wide open. A lot of people were thinking Whitelock would come back in and Barrett would go to to flank to flanker, but Frizzell, he's he's making making New Zealand think right now, isn't he? And what a great problem to have. Loved the game, absolutely loved it, and tactical masterclass from New Zealand. I'm gonna go maybe have a little watch of it again, dissect a little bit more, and I might come back with a a little bit more of a deep dive and into some specifics. But just what's your feeling right now? Where was the game won? Where was the game lost? What are the selection headaches that are left over? What are the areas that you're particularly happy with? And what is the 15 that New Zealand fans you want going into that game against France and South Africa? What changes do you want to see before the World Cup? Because um, this is going to get very, very interesting. I'll see you on the next video.